welcome everybody to Room for Discussion. Since the tragic death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in September, the streets of Iran have flooded with protesters seeking a change of the Ayatollah's regime. Brave women all over the country have thrown their hijabs in the fire and cut their hair in a call for freedom. Since the protests have started, over 500 protesters are believed to have been killed. So what exactly is happening in Iran? Are we watching a revolution or a slowly fading protest? And what is next for the Iranian people? Joining us today is Iranian women's rights activist Shadi Sadr, who's been fighting for justice with her organization, Justice for Iran. Please welcome to the stage, Ms. Shadi Sadr. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how are you feeling after your long trip? Um, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been a long trip, but I'm very glad that I uh, am here with you and your great audience today. Thank you. Wonderful. And of course, you're here with us to discuss these very important protests. So I think these protests are something that everyone in the room has heard about and cares about, but might not know the backstory of. So they all started after the death of a young Kurdish woman named Masha Amini back in September. Could you perhaps start off by explaining to us what has made this the tipping point? Uh, yeah, as uh, you mentioned, the uh, uh, death of 22-year-old uh, uh, Iranian Kurdish woman, Gina Mahsa Amini, sparked a nationwide protest uh, across the country. Uh, it was a tipping point uh, because I think many Iranians could see the suffering and discrimination that they had experienced uh, in the hands of the Iranian regime uh, for years. Discrimination, and you say? Discrimination, mm -hmm. yeah. And so many of us uh, and many, many more inside the country would say enough is enough. Uh, and since then, uh, uh, the revolution that I rather <clears throat> to call it Gina Revolution started, uh, uh, the Iranian P uh, society faced another phase of other phases of nationwide protest before, but I think this one was uh, different because of its unique characteristics. And uh, if I allow, I want to share some of the unique characteristics of what is happening, what has happened in Iran over the past few months. Yeah, let's, let's go into that. What were the unique characteristics? What made this protest so different from other previous protests? Mm, first of all, it is led by uh, young uh, people, mainly women. Uh, you, you may remember the uh, videos of young women uh, taking off their scarves, yeah. burning them in the middle of the streets and mobilizing the crowd to, uh, with the anti-regime slogans. Uh, this generation, um, mm, Someone, some, some in the West call them the Generation Z. <clears throat> the unique thing about the leading generation of this revolution, sorry, <clears throat> is that um, they share the values uh, um, and. Uh, like the, 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 their perspective is quite like other young people around the world. Um, they feel closer to, for example, a young uh, adult here in the Netherlands than their parents or even their older siblings. So these progressive values, uh, um, I think, was one of the reasons that the uh, slogan, Woman Life Freedom, uh, has uh, had a very central place during the protest. It actually refers to the progressiveness of the revolution and tell us that this generation uh, do know that what they don't want, they want, they want to get rid of the regime, but also they uh, clearly know that, uh, they know what they want for the future Iran. They want to get rid of a theocracy, they want to establish a, a, a secular democracy, which is very important. Another unique aspect of this protest is its diversity. People, Iranian people of all walks of life have been participating in the protest. We haven't seen that before in the previous protest, that all of the ethnic minority groups 
uh, all of the social and economic classes, so different groups uh, from school children to the university students to workers have come to the streets and also uh, um, uh, initiated strikes. It was nationwide, it was across the country, and it was so diverse both in terms of those who participating and also in terms of the demands. And also LGBTI individual and community have had a great role in those protests. So why have you seen such a coalition of people from across uh, population? Um, I think we should not forget the fact that uh, the majority of Iranians uh, have invested over two decades on the idea of reform and hoping that the reformist or moderates uh, would bring, the, uh, bring about some real changes. Right. That didn't happen. That uh, It turned uh, out to be uh, pointless. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we have reached to a point that the majority of Iranians uh, are completely frustrated with all fractions of the regime. And, and on the other hand, they have reached to the point that both from economic and political aspects of their life that they, they, they can't have that dictatorship regime anymore. So that's why they, they, they became united came to the streets, and also attracted such a widespread international solidarity. Right. So is there a difference, you think, between uh, protesters in rural areas of Iran versus Tehran? Uh, so the interesting thing about this uh, 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 Gina revolution is that, as I mentioned, that it was nationwide, and people in small towns as well as people in the large cities like capital city Tehran, Mashhad and Shiraz have also participated in the protest. So you couldn't see any difference, any real difference between uh, their demands. And, but, but those living in the ethnic minority populated areas yeah. uh, have had a, had a more active role in the protest. We shouldn't forget that Jina belonged to the Kurdish yeah. ethnic minority. So the, the protest started from Kurdistan. And then uh, in other ethnic minority populated region, Baluchistan, the protests have been ongoing uh, since the start of the, uh, since the beginning and every single, on an, uh, every single Friday. One of the reasons that ethnic minority groups have been one of the most disadvantages and marginalized group. Uh, after the Islamic Republic, they have uh, uh, experienced layers of suffering and discrimination on the basis of their ethnicity and their religion. Right. So they are the ones that they have nothing to lose. So they are the ones that who have sacrificed the most. To understand fully the goal of these protests, you've said that it's not a protest against Islam. What do you mean by this? Um, I don't uh, remember that I mentioned okay. that, but but uh, some some people in the in um, Islamic countries, especially yeah. in Islamic countries, um, in especially in the beginning when we saw women burning their scarves, would actually misunderstood the meaning of burning scarves or taking off the scarf or say uh, no to the Islamic Republic with uh, uh, that the, the protests are about Islam. The protests are about political Islam, are about getting rid of the theocracy. Uh, people in Iran want, uh, want a secular democracy, right. but, but they're not anti-hijab. Uh, you could see women with uh, covering themselves with hijab, religious women, shoulder to shoulder with women without hijab came to the streets. Uh, so it's, it's, it's about a government that uses the religion as a tool of repression. Right. Right. You've recently been seeing less of the protests in Western media. Uh, so day to day, what do these protests still look like on the ground today? Um, yeah, the uh, Iran's protests are no longer in, uh, in the front line of the newspapers, yeah. unfortunately, because um, I think the government has managed to slow down the protest with a, uh, a brutal crack crackdown. Yeah. Over 500 people have been killed in the streets. Uh, 
and many thousands have been severely injured, um, at least 20,000 people are in prison under severe torture. Some of them have been charged uh, with uh, uh, waging against God or uh, uh, um, corruption on earth that carry death penalty. At least four protesters have been already executed and there are many more in the death row. So you can imagine um, basically everyone who, wa who was the leader of the protest or could be potentially leaders of the protest are now in prison. And uh, many thousands families and uh, neighbors and friends have been affected by uh, the scale and brutality of the crackdown. But it doesn't mean that the, the revolution has gone away. The revolution is still very much alive, and you can see the indications of that in every corner of the streets. Mm -hmm. Women are still resisting the compulsory hijab, uh, despite the uh, uh, high prices that they have to pay. And also, people have been manifesting their opposition to the government in one way or another. And on the other hand, uh, our contacts in Iran uh, are telling us, keep telling us, uh, and wants us to amplify that voice to the international community, to the outside world, that we shouldn't forget that revolution is not a single event. Revolution is a process, and it takes time. Uh, people are organizing themselves in a, a small local groups and rethinking of the strategy and deciding about the next steps and how those taking those next steps uh, would ultimately achieve uh, the goal, which is toppling uh, the Iranian, uh, the Islamic regime and replacing it with a democracy. And all of us uh, are sure those like us who observe, not only observe the situation in Iran, but also uh, deeply engage with the situation, we are sure that the next phase of uh, street protest yeah. will come to the surface very soon. Right. So you think there's a next step coming soon? Definitely. Right. And you, how do you feel about the concept of the revolution at the moment? Are you feeling uh, assured that it's actually going to lead to revolution? What do you mean? How hopeful are you? Um, I, I am very hopeful because, uh, because I think many things have shifted dramatically over the past four uh, uh, months. Uh, and we owe it to the uh, courageous right. young women and men who sacrificed their lives to show a completely different Iran to the international community, to the outside world. Before that, the, the dominant narrative yeah. at the international level was that the, there are two fractions within the governments, reformists or moderates, uh, the conservatives or principalists, and these, there, there is a real power struggle between these two fractions, and yeah. people go to the voting poll uh, uh, to um, uh, vote to the moderates or reformists, hoping that there would be a change. And also the like the whole concept of um, uh, a non-democratic, non-functional government would ha would actually not be, and, and also human rights violation wouldn't be discussed before, okay. as much as you uh, are seeing the discussion very openly. In, at the international level. So for me, things has changed and has shifted at the international level. At least now, we as human rights defenders, as human rights lawyers, uh, have, uh, do not have to convince the politicians here in the Netherlands or elsewhere that uh, Iran is being run by a bunch of brutal murderers. And also, internally, at the domestic level, I mm -hmm. think people have found their own power, people have found themselves, people have discovered that the, the will, the demands for 
overthrowing the regime is so strong, is very well rooted, and is widespread. It mm. is not limited to uh, one ethnicity or one social group or one generation. It is intergenerational and it is across all over the uh, society. And it's just they are just now organizing themselves, waiting for a right momentum to uprise again. Right. right. So you've mentioned that there is very much still uh, a strong morale among the protesters. Is that different than it was in September? What is happening now? Yeah, the sense of, of, of willingness to fight among the protesters. Mm, I think the sense is still the same, yeah. but uh, the ability to manifest it, to demonstrate it, is right. not the same. Because, yeah. because the, the brutal crackdown uh, has always an, an impact right. on protesters. You, from the very first beginning, all of us knew that uh, the, the, there is an ongoing, unjust battle between empty-handed protesters and also a regime that has one of the most sophisticated security forces in the region. So that unjust battle could not be won without the active and effective uh, reaction by the international community. And I'm afraid to say that the international community hasn't uh, taken the steps that had been uh, needed by right. the Iranian to just uh, change the, uh, uh, the, the battle and to win that battle, at least by now. And at least so far, we haven't seen that those effective measures taken by the international community, despite the words of solidarity, despite the condemnation, despite human rights sanctions, right. but they all have not been effective enough so far. I think before we talk more about the international community, it is really important that we actually understand the actions of the regime. So how are they intimidating protesters? What tactics do they use? So uh, one thing that has been shared by all of uh, uh, those who have participated in yeah. previous and current protests is the, br is the brutal crackdown, which means using um, live ammunition against okay. peaceful protesters, which led to at least over 500 uh, uh, people have been recorded dead, but the, the, the real number is likely to be much higher than that. Right. And thousands of people have been injured. Some of them have been severely injured. We have uh, seen uh, many cases of people, very young women or men, and even children, who uh, have been blinded by the shotgun and also by pellet bullets. The bullets are still in the bodies of many protesters. They cannot go to the medical centers or to the doctors and hospitals to be right. treated because the security forces are everywhere and if they uh, know that someone is, uh, was injured in the protest, they would come after the, them and arrest them. And also mass arrest has been used as a tactic to silence protesters. Uh, they, have, they have been using uh, all types of torture against them, including rape and sexual abuse, and uh, also forced them to confess against themselves in front of the camera, uh, telling the narratives that the government want to broadcast from uh, the uh, state-sponsored uh, television saying that they, uh, they were armed or they were a bunch of terrorists or they were funded by the Western countries, uh, all false narratives. And, and as I mentioned, also executions uh, have been used as another tactic of suppression. Yeah. I've personally read horrible accounts of women being targeted specifically in their eyes and other sensitive parts of their bodies. Do you indeed see that women are targeted differently than men by these intimidation tactics? Um, I think um, be because of the leading role that yeah. young women had, uh, uh, have had in this revolution, they have been specifically targeted, and especially very young ones, even mm. uh, men, um, children. Uh, have been targeted, and and also another 
um, uh, tactic that have been used more against women in a widespread manner uh, uh, is a rape and sexual abuse. And uh, one of the uh, young women in Tehran who was released uh, on bail, uh, she was talking to me about her experience of being raped by uh, three uh, um, security forces. And she told me that when they were raping her, they kept say, telling her, okay, we are doing that because this is what you wanted. You wanted freedom for women, this is freedom for women. This is what you wanted, you, you're getting that. And yeah. then asking her to go, uh, when, when she uh, is released, go out and say openly and publicly that she, she was raped. And this was another, and, and she, she, she told me that I didn't want to be their messenger, so that's why I didn't tell anyone uh, but very, my, my very close friends about yeah. the experience. But she was released on bail yeah. after imprisonment. Is that a common tactic as well, to kind of arrest it people is. and then send them out as a messenger? Uh, it is. Uh, so they would release uh, many, many of the prisons because the prisons are overcrowded. Right. So they, they cannot keep all of them yeah. forever. Uh, so they release on, uh, them on bail. Yeah. So in that sense, you, you take the property of the family. Uh, it's c c another kind of like house arrest or hostage taking yeah. because that person wouldn't say anything or wouldn't do anything because as, as soon as they do, uh, uh, they, they, they do something, uh, that property wouldn't be confiscated. And then they have to wait until the trial and then until the appeal process is uh, over. So it's, it takes a long time that not only one person as a detainee, but also the whole family uh, is being detained. actually kind of detained or hostage by the government. That's why some people uh, would suggest that uh, instead of the word uh, detention, we, yeah. we should use the um, uh, hostage taking yeah. or abduction. Right, abduction. Um, actually, speaking about abduction, I think the group that we hear most about or that we were hearing most about was the morality police. Um, there's a lot of misinformation or a lot of confusion about whether or not the morality police were disbanded. So were they disbanded? They uh, haven't been disbanded. Okay. Uh, so, um, so where's this rumor coming yeah. from? Yeah, I think that was the part of a uh, uh, propaganda this information campaign successfully run by the Iranian government right. on the occasion that if you uh, remember uh, a few days before the announcement of this banning uh, or annulment of uh, the morality police, the UN was supposed to vote uh, uh, of removal of the Islamic Republic from the UN um, uh, Commission of the Status of Women. So right before that, a few days after that, so they started this, this, this info yeah. campaign, and unfortunately, the global media bought that and became a part of that propaganda disinformation campaign. And uh, that rumor uh, spread it very rapidly before any of us could do anything. Right. But, but another thing that you should actually think about that is the morality police is just one mm. enforcement measure amongst many others, uh, other measures that have been adopted by the Islamic Republic since the 1979 revolution right. to, uh, to ensure that women observe uh, the compulsory hijab. Uh, and, uh, and it's just, I, just as an example, yeah. I, uh, mm, I brought this uh, book uh, to just show to your audience. It's a 235 pages book, and it's called, it, it's a collection of the laws, uh, regulations, and decrees about the compulsory hijab. So it's not just one article yeah. in the <clears throat> penal code and one enforcement mechanism as the morality police. Yeah. It's uh, several uh, articles and also uh, numerous enforcement mechanisms 
uh, that imposed hijab by sanctioning women at every single public space, from workplaces to university, from uh, schools to even parks or restaurants. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the morality police is not, as I mentioned, the only sanction mentioned by the, um, uh, adopted by the government. If you disobey the hijab rules, yeah. you may lose your job. You may uh, get uh, you may, may get fired from university. Uh, you may not obtain a license to open a shop. And when you open a shop as a woman, and those who visiting your shop, or for example, if you have a restaurant, those who are eating at your restaurant, disobeying those rules, your restaurant or your license would be uh, canceled. Mm -hmm. So you can, and, and there are rules and regulations written in the laws about those uh, practices. So this is a uh, very institutionalized right. yeah. uh, in laws and practice uh, and cannot be go it cannot be gone away without a complete uh, uh, change of legislation first of all in the penal code which uh, um, according to that disobeying the hijab rule is a, a punishable offense mm -hmm. and then in many many other laws and rules so even if that rumor was correct, yeah. and the morality police was disbanded, so it didn't, it couldn't change anything because at the same time, women would be uh, fired for not having the scarves in their workplaces or be sanctioned in one way or another. Yeah. So to make that a bit more concrete, perhaps, uh, I myself am now a 24-year-old student here at the University of uh, Amsterdam, doing my master's. If I was instead an Iranian student going to the University of Tehran, and also a woman, uh, what would my life look like? I myself went to the University of Tehran. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I, um, I should start from a, like a, a little bit earlier in, in the yeah. life, because when you grow up as a girl, yeah. in a country like Iran, you soon learn, it, it doesn't matter how much secular or uh, um, anti-religious or non-religious your family would be, you uh, soon realize that you are considered as a second class citizen. Mm. So uh, the compulsory hijab is, the on, is not the only discriminatory laws against women. There are a list of, long list of discriminations in laws and practices against women, against girls. So from the age of seven, when yeah. you go to school, you have to have the compulsory hijab. Yeah. I uh, went to school um, uh, for the first time. And at, the, at, at that year, after the revolution, they, uh, that was the first year that they imposed uh, the, the compulsory hijab as a part of the school uniform. And we had, as like very little girls, we had to wear uh, something called magna'e, which is, uh, uh, which uh, looks like, which is like a bag yeah. in a, with a hole here yeah. uh, to ensure that you are fully covered uh, except for your face. So you can okay. breathe, you can see, but m nothing else. Yeah. And then... If can, how did that feel for you? Like, walking into school and was, immediately it having... It was horrible, and it, you don't get used to it. Okay. You don't get used to it, uh, and it's just... It's, it's always there, and yeah. ev every single day, you have to uh, convince yourself to... Uh, just obey those rules because you you have to go to yeah. school to universities yeah. everywhere and also you have to resist it right. Right. women have been resisting the compulsory hijab and other discriminatory laws yeah. uh, since the uh, inception of the Islamic Republic mm -hmm. and since the inception of those rules my entire childhood was deeply affected by the Islamiza Islamization process that took place during the 1980s. So the Islamization process, <clears throat> which involved making all of the laws and aspects of your life Islamic, yeah. according to the interpretation of the regime, mm -hmm. was not only about hijab or discriminatory rules, but also during very simple things like prohibition of drinking alcohol, yeah. prohibition of extramarital relationship, uh, corporal punishment for same-sex uh, relationship between adults, and 
even, even banking system became Islamic. So, and then coming from background, going to university, <coughs> and <coughs> like many others, have been resisting those rules um, in your personal life, and also um, as, as, as a university student. So I, I uh, experienced my first participation in a protest in university and the second year. And it was because some of our very great teachers were uh, getting fired by uh, some people because they, they, they didn't teach us as like according to yeah. the, um, uh, the Islamic rules and laws. And we were, we were studying law. But weren't they putting themselves at risk <coughs> by doing that? Yeah, they, they got fired, most yeah. of them. We, we could save a few of them yeah. right, with our protests. But then at the age of 19, I uh, participated in those protests. And then um, I was also arrested twice. Both of the times was because of participating in peaceful protests mm. for women's rights. So the right to freedom of assembly, as you can see, now has been violated very uh, severely and very brutally. Ha so, but, but, but you can see at the, at the same time the resistance of Iranian people um, against those uh, uh, dictatorship rules and laws. And if I can ask, what was your experience of the arrest, of your arrest? Like, what happened in that process? No, first time or second time? Let's go with first time, <laughs> okay. Excuse me, sorry. Um, yeah, first time we were a bunch of uh, women's rights activists in, um, protesting in front of the Revolutionary Court. Where, and, and when was this? Uh, 2000, March 2007, a few okay. days before the International Women's Day. So we right. were supposed yeah. to celebrate uh, International Women's Day, the 8th of March, mm -hmm. but I think they were arrested as a few, uh, like uh, 3rd of March or 4th of March, I don't remember correctly. Um, but then, so we were protesting outside the Revolutionary Court um, because they, uh, five of us, yeah. our friends and our fellow activists, were being uh, um, uh, tried in, in a court for another peaceful protest that took, took place a few months ago. And then um, a van, which was quite like the morality police van, came to the scene and took uh, each of us, started beating us first and then took each of us and uh, uh, just put in the van. And then they took us to the same detention center that it Mahsa Jina Amini was the, uh, oh, really? died there. Yeah, it's called the Wazara detention, center, Wazara. Wazara detention center, which is in central Tehran. So they took us there, yeah. they put us in cells, uh, but the, we were th th the, the, there were 33 of us. Mm -hmm. And then we were, because we were collectively arrested, uh, our morale was uh, quite high. So we kept uh, singing <coughs> so <coughs> songs, chatting with each other. So, um, and then um, around, so it, it happened um, in the afternoon and around midnight, they took us to a Vin prison, the notorious Vin yeah. prison, and put us in different cells. Could you describe a Vin prison for us um, on the inside? Yeah, I've been to a Vin prison in different uh, um, um, roles right. as prisoners and also as lawyers. Yeah. Because as a lawyer, I visited my um, uh, clients who uh, were women who had been sentenced to stoning by uh, uh, to, to death by stoning or other corporal punishment. So I, uh, before I was arrested, um, I had visited uh, Evin so many times in, in the role of lawyer. So it's, um, what should I say? It's a prison and it's, uh, um, it's, then it's notorious not because of the buildings, but because of the horror that people have experienced in, um, inside those walls. Right. And uh, um, yeah, uh, so it reminded you uh, many, many beautiful lives that have been taken those who have fought for uh, freedom and, and democracy were executed in Evin yeah. and um, or kept for years. Right. So you already mentioned you worked as a lawyer as well. So I think in this day and age, the term human rights law in Iran seems a bit like an oxymoron. So what did your job as a lawyer within that system look like? How did you do that? 
It's a very interesting question because uh, uh, I, <laughs> um, I kept asking myself the same question when I was representing those women because within uh, the, the within the discriminatory. Uh, legal system, it's very difficult to yeah. save a woman's life, but but then you have to because it's just you are the only one that uh, uh, they have and they hope that you can save them. What we did is just was not limited our work as a lawyers to law because mm. it was pointless, but uh, parallelly initiated campaigns and trying to get the help of uh, some international organizations such as Amnesty International uh, to save women from stoning, from execution. Yeah. So uh, the international campaigns, for example, we initiated a campaign called Stop Stoning Forever, yeah. which was an international campaign and successfully uh, managed to save uh, do dozens of uh, women and I think three men from stoning. Uh, but our ultimate goal, which was the abolishment of a stoning from law, had never happened. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying that we have tried, as the Iranian people, as the activists, as women, we have tried to, we have tried to, ref, uh, to change, some, to, to bring about some changes from within, and it turned out completely impossible. So that's why we are now talking about revolution because revolution is the only solution that uh, we have. It's a very, uh, it's, so, so we may lose so many beautiful lives yeah. in, in this way, but, but people, are, people in Iran don't have any other way in front of them to get rid of the dictatorship, to, just put an end to an oppressive regime. Right. I think this will be a good time to open up the floor to any audience questions. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand and we'll pick a few people. The lady here in the front with the pink jacket. Yeah, there will be a microphone coming your way. Thank you. Ah, okay. So first of all, welcome to Netherlands, uh, Miss, Miss Saad. I'm Soraya. Uh, just a little bit, just uh, I make an introduction of myself that uh, I work as a professor in international law for the university in Iran for eight years. And I was the director of law department. So really I feel, I see and I touch the fact. So, and thank you that you are here and also and thank you for the other students uh, are here and also for the uh, student that organized that and make it sensitive about Iran because really we need the help of the world. That's we know and this is the reality that alone the people in Iran cannot achieve the goal of the revolution. But I have a legal um, opinion, it's a solution maybe. I want to know your idea about that. That as you know, we have the ICC court, International Criminal Court, which is in Den Haag. And what is doing this International Criminal Court is making a trial yeah, over uh, the governments. And as we know, there are four international crimes written in the statute of this International Criminal Court. One of them is when a government is making uh, yeah, crime against the human rights or humanity or human dignity. So which is now very clearly happens now in Iran. And I want to know your idea about the possibility to make a complaint in this court against the government of Iran. Really, why not? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, shall I answer yeah, the question? Yes, um, I wish we could have uh, um, take the uh, case against the Islamic Republic to the International Criminal Court, but unfortunately, Iran is not uh, uh, has not ratified the ICC. Um, uh, it's not a member of the court, and uh, uh, therefore, right. the court doesn't have any jurisdiction over that. That. That, that has been one of the issues uh, that uh, 
the only possible way yeah. to uh, take the case uh, of the uh, crimes committed by the Islamic regime to the ICC is through the UN Security Council. And as we know from the case of Syria, uh, China and Russia would uh, veto uh, if, if, if it, the, the case goes there, by some other members of the UN, Human, uh, UN Security Council, so ch China and Russia would veto it. So uh, th there is no other way. Right. What I should say is that there is no any uh, right for a veto in the ICC. That is for the UN. No, just um, the United. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Well, uh, so that's uh, that's the only reason that neither the case of Syria nor the case of Iran hasn't been uh, okay. reviewed by the ICC because Iran is not a member of the court and uh, uh, has not accepted the jurisdiction of ICC. But uh, and that's why, for example, uh, Justice for Iran initiated. Um, um, together with two other NGOs initiate the Iran's Atrocities Tribunal, which was a people's tribunal, to investigate the crime that took place during the uh, November 2019, the same crime that as it is happening now. And a panel of six renowned international jurists reviewed the case and came to that conclusion after two uh, years proceeding and after hearing over 300 witnesses from inside the country that the, the Iranian government and uh, uh, the highest officials such as the supreme leader, the president, um, uh, the uh, IRGC uh, uh, and, uh, and police commanders committed crimes against humanity during the November 2010. So I share the same conclusion as you mentioned that the Iranian security forces, the Iranian officials and the regime is committing crime another uh, crime against humanity, but unfortunately, the avenues of accountability at the international level are quite limited. Okay. Right, there will be time to discuss that afterwards. Yeah, sorry, well. no, I'm sorry. We will take one more question, and then you can ask further questions after. Uh, you in the back there in the blue shirt. Hey, uh, thank you for being here. Um, my question is connected to that question in a way, what are things other governments could do to make a difference on the ground in Iran? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for asking that very important question. Uh, so since the beginning of uh, the revolution, uh, the Iranian civil society and, uh, um, and also uh, both inside and outside the country have suggested a very few concrete recommendations to the international community as measures that are uh, seen by us as effective. Because we think that the measures that have been taken by the international community so far has not been uh, effect effective to the extent that uh, dismantle the oppression system. One of the measures that have been suggested to the international community is uh, um, listing the uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, as a terrorist organization. Basically naming it as it is, because it is a terrorist organization. And while it was listed by the US in 2019, uh, Canada, UK, EU, and other countries have been reluctant to take the same measures. Uh, there have been some positive steps toward it, uh, especially in the Canadian, uh, in the uh, European Parliament. But we are very far from uh, that, as um, um, as far as I understand from the words of the politicians at the European level and also as at the uh, uh, UK. Um, the other. Uh, recommendations was just delegitimizing the Iranian regime because people in Iran keep asking the global community how come you can give the credibility and legitimacy to a regime that kills its own citizens, its children. 
So how can this regime can be rep the representative of uh, the Iranian people? So if, if any action that help in uh, help with delegitimizing the regime uh, through dismantling the oppression system or even weakening it at the international level would be very welcome and would be more effective. One of the, the other suggestion is just suspending or stopping the nuclear negotiations. The other suggestions have been uh, is uh, just closing down the embassies of the Islamic regime around the world and especially in the EU. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, none of those uh, recommendations have been uh, adopted by uh, the, neither by the EU nor the UK. Right, thank you. Those were the audience questions. Um, so you already mentioned that the EU Parliament um, was discussing putting these members of the Revolutionary Guard on the international terrorist list. What would that practically mean for those members if that actually were to happen? What kind of effect would that have? Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the Islamic Revolutionary uh, Guard Corps of the IRGC is uh, just it's, it's not only the most important uh, um, repressive uh, ent entity of the repression or security forces, right. but also has uh, hands in the economy of Iran everywhere and also outside Iran. So basically the economy of the Islamic Republic is being run by the IRGC. Mm. So if the IRGC is listed as a terrorist organization, not only its military activities will be quite limited, their access to the weapon will be limited, but also their economic activities will be limited and they, they, they wouldn't be able to generate money as much as they can. And that money is being used to repress the Iranian people, to repress the protesters. And also the other aspect of that, which is not very symbolic, but uh, also in, is, a, is a very important step towards delegitimizing a regime, is that we shouldn't forget that according to the Islamic Republic Constitution, the IRGC is a part of the military, uh, is the part of the military uh, forces of, the, of Iran. So if the EU, least the IRGC as a terrorist organization yeah. basically uh, recognizes the fact that yeah. the, the entire regime is a terrorist regime. Right. right. And you yourself are also doing a lot of work in trying to bring justice to Iran. Uh, so you established your organization Justice for Iran in exile in London. Uh, how did you end up in London? <laughs> um, um, by accident. So, um, yeah, I was arrested in 2009. Yeah, we can go back to the arrest for a second. Yeah, <laughs> during one of the uh, post-election protests, which right. is known uh, as the Green, Green Movement. Revolution. And uh, then when I was released on bail, I, I didn't actually uh, intend to uh, um, leave the country, but, but a few days after I was released, uh, uh, the hardline uh, newspaper in Iran uh, published the, an indictment by Tehran's prosecutor at the time, uh, uh, mentioning me, my name as uh, um, and accusing me as the leader of the, the leader of the wing, the, uh, the women's wing of the Velvet Revolution. Mm. So that was quite uh, uh, that was quite a serious allegation, and I knew that they would come after me, me yeah. again. And this time, I wouldn't be released anytime soon. So I had to escape Iran. I found myself and my daughter in uh, Turkey in less than 24 hours. I left everything behind. And then, uh, with the help of Heinrich Boll Foundation, I uh, got a scholarship there for a few months. And then, um, a, an international women's rights organization called Women Living Under Muslim Law offered me a job in London. So I yeah. moved to London. Yeah. And then yeah. in London, um, I co-founded Justice for Iran with, uh, with my friend and colleague Shadi Amin. Yeah. And uh, because at that time, before that, and still, the uh, issue of impunity and, and, and the crisis of impunity has been one of the most uh, uh, important issues when, when we discuss human rights. So you, you can see uh, the perpetrators of grave human rights violations uh, enjoy the absolute impunity 
victims of uh, those violations cannot seek uh, justice and accountability at the domestic level. And the avenue to seek justice and accountability uh, outside Iran are quite yes. limited. So we established justice for Iran uh, to, uh, first of all, to address the chronic issue of impunity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also they identify the perpetrators of grave human rights abuses and international crimes, trying to hold them accountable using those very limited uh, accountability mechanisms at international level. Yeah. So could you share with us who the people who you've identified in connection to the current protests are? Uh, we have... So in, in October yeah. uh, uh, last year, like one month after the uprising started, we published a, uh, uh, a call uh, for information about those responsible uh, uh, for the crackdown. And over 24 hours, we received more than uh, 1,000 1, communications from people inside the country. So those information included photos, names, and also the details of the involvement of people who were a part of yeah. the, the suppression uh, system and the crackdown. And since then, uh, we have uh, stored that, that information, we have uh, started verifying the information. Um, I, I, I don't have the latest update, but I think over 100 uh, people responsible for the crackdown crack, uh, have been not only identified, but also the information about them have been verified and submitted to the international uh, accountability mechanisms, uh, the governments uh, of the countries that have uh, uh, the so-called Magnitsky Act that sanctions uh, human rights violators, including freezing their assets, travel bans, and mm -hmm. also um, uh, not only the individuals, but also the entities involved in um, human rights violation. And also we have submitted the information to the UN human rights mechanisms. Yeah. And we are we're still doing that on a weekly basis. How do these people communicate with you? How do you get your information? Um, you know that um, one of the uh, suppression um, yeah. uh, tactics that the Iranian uh, regime has been used uh, to just uh, suppress the voice of the uh, Iranian protester is restrictions of the internet. Uh, in that, in with using that, so they disconnect the protesters from each other and they disconnect them from the outside world. But then, um, so even with the restricted internet in, in, in like a few hours yeah. that people have relatively uh, workable internet connection. So they use um, secure communication uh, applications to communicate with us. Right, and that's how you collect the information then? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what concretely, what do you hope the outcome of this work to be? Our work or the revolution? Your work. We'll <laughs> start with your work. Uh, yeah, I think um, the ultimate goal of the, uh, our organization is just to hold uh, uh, those responsible for international crimes and grave human rights violations accountable. Um, our hope is uh, to just be a part of uh, uh, judicial processes, right. uh, criminal proceedings in the future Iran. Um, so this is one of uh, uh, the reasons that we are collecting information because we think our work would be uh, a great contribution to any kind of transitional processes that the Iranian people will decide. Either it will be fact-finding commissions or criminal proceedings or a combination of both. But our documentation, we hope that would play a vital role in the future. Uh, mm, right. uh, transitional justice processes. Can it help bring a vital role in bringing about that future, or only once the future is established? I think it's it's a process. It's, it's, okay. it's a, as as I mentioned, the revolution is a process, and also uh, seeking justice and accountability is a part is a is a very important part of the process. The the fact that over thousands of people inside the country contacted us, providing yeah. us with yeah. that information, was not only because they hoped that someday in the future uh, there would be 
uh, courts or criminal proceedings or fact-finding commissions, but they hope that in, in the meantime, when yeah. the revolution goes on, we can um, um, hold those perpetrators in, uh, into account. And that actually be kind of preventive to right. deter them or other perpetrators or potential perpetrators to commit further crimes. Right. Yeah. Preventative. Right. So you've lived through several protests in Iran. What do you expect to happen next? I think, as I mentioned, um, sooner or later there will be another wave of uh, nationwide uprising. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us have uh, to be prepared for that. Uh, in addition to what we are doing at the moment, uh, one very important thing that I just want to ask everyone to think about it and to do something about it is the fact that many people are still in, in prisons yeah. and they need our support. They need, we, we should try to just amplify their voice and do not let their stories that are being forgotten in the middle of like uh, the news about Ukrainian war, elections, uh, 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 power sluggers in different countries. Uh, and, and we shouldn't forget that several people are in the death row and we should collectively try not to let the, to, to increase the political pressure on the Iranian regime uh, that can, they cannot execute them, and that the, the political prisoners will be re prisoners will be released. One of the very, uh, I think, effective initiative that was taken by, firstly, by the MPs, by the German MPs, was the uh, so-called representative. So each MP uh, calls themselves as a representative of a prisoner inside in, in Iran. Mm -hmm. And then take that case as a representative to and, um, uh, and uh, make publicity around the case, talk about that case with the media, with the politician. And that has been quite effective so far, but there are other uh, uh, ways to save those lives and to make sure that the political prisoners are released soon. Yeah. So what would a post-revolution Iran look like? I think it depends on uh, so many things, but I can just share my, my wishes and my hopes. So I, I think the post-revolutionary Iran is quite like the, uh, it's quite like what Sarina Ismailzade wanted. Sarina was a 16-year-old uh, girl from the city of Karaj who participated in protests and were killed by the security forces. Uh, by they, um, by she, she was she was hit on her head several times, so quite brutally in the middle of a street. She she was killed, but. The legacy of Sarina was not only so that moment that she was killed by the security forces, but the the videos that she was she was a YouTuber. So, be I uh, I'm I'm still watching Sarina's videos. I have watched them several times, and also she had a Telegram channel. She posted uh, her notes and. Uh, uh, pictures on that Telegram channel sharing her thoughts. So she, as I mentioned in the beginning of my uh, conversation with you, she as the other uh, young women and men who led this revolution had a very concrete idea about the future of Iran. She, she said that we want freedom, we want uh, prosperity and uh, we, we want to be happy. And I think all of them are manifested in the slogan, Woman Life Freedom. So what I want is to achieve what is in Woman Life Freedom slogan. And finally, what needs to happen to actually achieve her vision? Um, 
I'm, I'm not very quite sure about the process because, because, as I mentioned, on the one hand, we have a brutal regime, which is still in power. We have a reluctant, slow international community. They have shown their solidarity, but they haven't shown enough, uh, an they haven't sent enough a strong message to the Iranian government that to stop their bloodshed. And also we have a society that has been affected deeply by the suppression, but then the demand for a fundamental change is still very alive. I think uh, the next time that they come, yeah. they, they, they took in, in the streets, the international community has to be quicker, has to be more effective. And I think our job is just to keep pushing the international community to take unnecessary steps and to get ready for the next step because otherwise uh, the Iranian uh, people cannot get rid of the regime alone and empty handed. Okay, thank you so much Shadi Sadr for coming and sharing your story with us today and also sharing the story of Iran and uh, woman life freedom. A big thank you to the audience as well. We will have uh, the rector of the UVA, Peter Prover Beek, with us here on stage uh, in two days, on Wednesday at 1 p.m. And then on the 7th of February, we will have the Secretary General of the Red Cross NL, Marike van Schaik, also at 1 p.m. So we would love to see you there again. Um, all of our interviews are available on podcast and on YouTube, including this one. Um, and we will also have a newsletter, which will send you a preview of upcoming interviews please just get in touch with any of us if you're interested in signing up. And thank you so much thank for coming today. Thank you for having me, thank you so much.